Okay, so today I thought I would share with you one of my favourite women from the 17th century, a veritable 17th century Scarlett O'Hara called Elizabeth Murray. Now Elizabeth is remarkable because she lived and she came of age right at the very heart of the English Civil War and it's through her story that you'll see those connections if you know the story of Gone with the Wind with Scarlett O'Hara. So Elizabeth is synonymous with a house called Ham House, which I was very lucky to work at for um, about six months when I was about 21 before I decided to become a history teacher. And it is a house, a 17th century mansion, um, developed from an, an early Elizabethan mansion, um, just uh, on the outskirts of Richmond, literally between Richmond and Kingston. So she grew up both in the shadows of the old medieval palace of Richmond that Henry VII had built and loved, and then later Hampton Court Palace, which was still being used at the time when she would have known it at court. And interestingly, she both knew Hampton Court as a royal palace, but also a royal prison during the Civil War, but a little bit more of that later on. So Elizabeth was born into an Anglo-Scottish family. Um, her parents had been brought down to England um, at the time of the ascension of James I, and her father, Sir William Murray, had been the young Prince Charles, the future Charles I's whipping boy. So in the schoolroom, when Charles had gotten something wrong as a younger man, he would have seen his best friend, Sir William, Elizabeth's father, hit for it. Because um, in the periods in the schoolroom, as you were being educated, you would be physically hurt for making mistakes or getting things wrong. But obviously, you can't hurt a prince, so you hurt his best friend instead. And now, whilst today we might think, what a dreadful job to have, in the 17th century, what it did come along with was prestige and royal connections and titles and lands. So Elizabeth's family were very wealthy and very well connected indeed. And that should have led for Elizabeth, should have led to for Elizabeth a very charmed life. But unfortunately for her, her dad's best mate um, helps to trigger the Civil War in 1642. So at the age of 16, she sees her father go off to war to fight alongside Charles I. And she very rarely sees him from that point onwards. In fact, her father will die in exile um, six years after the execution of Charles I in 1655. Now, during this time of the Civil War, Elizabeth is 16, 17, 18. She's in her um, early teens and early 20s by the time it finishes. She is actually the eldest daughter and there are no sons in the family, so she comes into her father's inheritance. And she becomes, just like Scarlett O'Hara, throughout the Civil War, desperate to maintain her control of Ham House. And now this is in a period where women had no legitimate political power. So what she uses is her intelligence and her charms and all the tools that she has on her side to maintain her control of the family house for her and her sisters and her mother. So what she decides to do is become in public a parliamentarian. So at the time when the Civil War has turned and the Royalists are on the back foot, she decides to befriend parliamentarians, but not any parliamentarian. She goes straight to the source. So whilst Oliver Cromwell is staying in Kingston, she invites him around for dinner and she charms him. He becomes a regular dinner guest and there are even rumours that begin to spread that perhaps Elizabeth is his mistress. Now whether that's true or not, I don't think that's probably the case. I think like most early modern women who use their influence, the easiest way to put a lady like that who stepped out of the norms of society um, back in her places to spread a rumour about her. So whether she was his mistress or not, perhaps we'll never know. Um, but she is at heart a steadfast royalist and aristocrat. She is a parliamentarian pragmatically. So while she is smiling at Oliver Cromwell and having him round for dinner in the marble dining room, she is secretly below stairs preparing letters and documents and gold and money to send off to the continent 
for the young Prince Charles, the future Charles II. And in 1653, she becomes one of the leading figures in the secret underground organisation known as the Sealed Knot, the group of royalists who secretly, during the height of Cromwell's power, are campaigning behind closed doors for the return of Charles as Charles II. And she does this subterfuge, this playing the two sides off against each other so well, that in 1660, when Charles returns back to England in glory, um, she is actually given a pension of £800 a year to thank her for her spying and her secret 17th century service. So she becomes a very wealthy woman in her own right. She's being paid the equivalent, just from the king alone, some pocket money of about £100,000 in today's money. Now what's really interesting about her is this house that she is synonymous with is so hers that when you actually go to the house you will see, despite the fact that she was married twice, pictures of her husband's but in the actual material of the house you will see that it is her when you read the logbooks who's paid the servants and who's brought all the furniture and you will also see literally when you look at some of the furniture that it's her name in there and not her husband's. She very much invites the husbands to stay at what she sees as her house and that's very interesting in a period of the 17th century when women live under a system of coverture. So you can see below me, uh, sorry behind me, this is an indenture which is a legal document from the, uh, from the later 17th century, early 18th century, which is literally a woman under the system of coverture handing over all her possessions and her money to her husband. Elizabeth doesn't do that, she stays wealthy in her own right and Ham always remains firmly in her possession. And if you go there today, I do suggest it, it is very much just as she left it. She was such a legend in her family that even in the later generations, they refused to change it. They didn't change the style, they maintained that 17th century time capsule that it still very much is today. And what's really remarkable about Elizabeth is she is a woman who, at the court of Charles II, wields influence and power in her own right. Um, she's very much in an early modern power couple with her husband, the Duke of Lauderdale, who is one of the key ministers at Charles II's court. And you can see her power in the amount of rumours that spread around her. Um, it's not believed that she could have that power and that influence in her own right. So rumours spread that she's a witch, that she uses witchcraft and spells to maintain her power. There are rumours that she's used her sexuality, so she's been the, she must have been the mistress of her second husband before she marries him to maintain control over him. And there are also rumours spread that she even poisoned the Duke of Lauderdale's first wife so that she could marry him. Now whether that's true or not, I certainly know from having stud uh, studied gender in the 17th century quite a lot that those sort of rumours are quite commonplace about women who sort of step out of the patriarchal norms of the period and sort of threaten 17th century society, so I'm not quite sure if they are correct. Um, there's certainly the Victorians did love the idea of it, so there is a Victorian ghost story that there was a small child sleeping one night at Ham and he heard, he woke up to the sound of scratching like a cat or nails on one of the, um, the wooden panels in the bedroom that he was staying in and when he woke up he found the Duchess's ghost pointing towards a panel and when the panel was prized open, supposedly there was this document written in her beautiful handwriting that showed these lists of poisons and spells that she'd been using to maintain her power and get rid of the first uh, wife of the Duchess, sorry, the Duke of Lauderdale, so that she could become the Duchess of Lauderdale. Um, there are also other stories that kind of show her power and how that, that sense of her power and her importance have gone down through history, through ghost stories. So I was very lucky um, when I worked at this house for a little while, in the summer of me being 21, to have been given a key so that I could arrive at the house quite early and open it up in the morning. And when I got there about 7, 7 o'clock, 7.30 in the morning, the house would pitch black and it was built uh, it's built in the enfilade style, which is very fashionable in the 17th century. So if you go to Versailles, if you go to a big 17th century house, you will find that all the doors in all the rooms will line up perfectly. And enfilade is a military term, which means to shoot straight in the 17th century. So you could technically shoot, the idea is that you can shoot a bullet from one end of the house through the other, and all the doors line up so perfectly that the bullet would go through the whole house without touching anything. And when you go to the suite of rooms that she designed in the 17th century, all the rooms lead slowly on to her bedroom in the, first, uh, in the furthest edge of the house. 
and when you're going through them and they're pitch black you're slowly working your way towards the duchess's bedroom that you know she died in at the age of 70 and there is this belief that the so that some of the people that work in the house to this day some of the stewards that work there still believe that you should as you're working your way towards the duchess's bedroom bow to her in the morning and say hello because if you don't the duchess will appear in her dressing table mirror and show her displeasure to you for giving her such a snub so that kind of shows you the power um, and the influence that this this woman had in the 17th century has today been converted into these ghost stories that have come down throughout history i mean she really was a remarkable woman this is a woman who um in the 1670s and 1680s um took so her husband her second husband the the duke of lauderdale involved with charles ii charles ii was involved in a lot of sea battles with the dutch and the french and um, had decided to have this magnificent bedroom for himself created after he'd moved into the house all beautiful dark mahogany wood and these inlaid battle scenes of ships um at war gray skies uh, this rough seas cannon going off these beautiful riot of sort of gray and red and dark colours, very very masculine room. She actually decided that after he designed it that she actually really quite liked it. So she, in the 17th century in a time of patriarchy when women should be meek and mild, kicks her husband, one of the most powerful ministers at the court of Charles II, out of this bedroom that he's created and shifts him a couple of rooms up to her old childhood bedroom which is this pastel concoction with images of tropical birds all around the walls and he just puts up with it. Um, she puts one of the first ever en suites in England downstairs, so she has a little staircase that goes downstairs. And that is the room that she died in, the room that her ghost is supposed to haunt. Um, I absolutely love her. If you'd like to learn more about her, go onto the Ham House website or onto the National Trust website. And if you are ever in London and you're near to London and you've been to Hampton Court or you're in Richmond, go along and visit the house. It is absolutely beautiful and it is so rare in that it is a 17th century house that still has all the furniture it would have had in that period. It wasn't sold off, it wasn't destroyed by fire. It is still there in situ, which makes it really, really special. And if you're a teacher and you are teaching the new GCSE spec, I implore you to use her in the Christine Council style as a window into the 17th century because she can give you such give the children such a window into attitudes towards women at the time, politics at the time, living through the Civil War, and then the libertinism of Charles II's court. So she is absolutely wonderful. Um, I love her and I'll be maintaining this YouTube channel and talking about some other 17th and 16th century women that I loved. Um, I'm a teacher and my specialisms are the medieval and the early modern period so I'll also be putting up some revision videos for students at GCSE and A level and hopefully maintaining this channel as an outlet for my history nerdiness. So if there is anybody else from the 15th, 16th or 17th centuries you would like to know about, um, put a comment or ask a question in uh, the comment section below. Um, like the channel or subscribe to the channel if you'd like to hear more history from me and thank you very much for watching.